Can you believe this? The two of us in the same house? Is this a crossover episode? No, I'm just kidding around, man. Seriously, though, how are you? The art of the crossover is one of the oldest tricks in the media playbook as we know it today. From Alf and Gilligan's Island, to Uncle Jesse and Steve Urkel, and even Archie and the Punisher for some reason, taking two or more big franchises and mashing them together to make one big crossover piece of media is a surefire way to pop interest in all fan bases. And gaming is not immune to this phenomenon, because you see, even in the last couple years, we've had some great crossovers from all over video games of all types of genres, from racing, sports, simulation, platforming, and even more. But when a character crosses over into fighting games, or a fighting game character jumps between games from the same genre, it feels ever so slightly more special. Game developers need to work that much harder to faithfully translate characters to their intricate systems of their game, while still keeping the guests' integrity intact and separate from the rest of the cast. In this video, I'll analyze a few crossovers and guest appearances that are good, bad, and sometimes just plain old weird. I don't think that I can do a video about fighting game crossovers without mentioning what is arguably the most famous one. Super Smash Bros. was released for the Nintendo 64 in 1998 after the most exhausted man in gaming, Masahiro Sakurai, wanted to make a four-player fighting game. He figured that fighting games don't quite sell as well as other video game genres, so to compensate he threw in some famous Nintendo characters in a prototype that he was building and had them fight it out, and the rest, as we know it, is history. But you know, I might be a bit of a stickler here, but it feels a bit lame to congratulate Nintendo on giving the okay to put their own characters into their own video game. So instead, I'd like to focus on the one moment in Smash history that I thought altered the course of the series forever. The event was E3 2006. At the time, Super Smash Bros. for the Nintendo 64 was that system's eighth best-selling game and Super Smash Bros. Melee was the GameCube's number one seller, moving 7 million copies. Now with the Nintendo Wii in its formative years, the pressure was on to finally show hardcore gamers that Nintendo had a lot more to offer them than just bowling with the family and whatever Red Steel was. So at an after-hours media-only briefing, Nintendo unveiled a trailer for Super Smash Bros. Brawl. And with this trailer, Nintendo started the slow, and gradual change of the Smash Bros. series from being a simple showcase of Nintendo's vast catalog to a celebration of gaming as a whole. And it all started right here. The announcement of Solid Snake joining the cast of Super Smash Bros. Brawl set the internet on fire. Snake's inclusion in Smash is significant in a few ways. First, Snake was the very first third-party playable character announced for the Smash series. He's also the first character in the Smash games from a series that's rated mature, and his appearance is based off of the 2001 game Metal Gear Solid 2 Sons of Liberty, which to this day has never been featured on a Nintendo console. According to an interview, Hideo Kojima, creator of Metal Gear, practically begged for Snake to be included in Smash, and from that point on, all bets were off, and it seemed like any game character from any series could join the fight at any moment. And that was only reinforced by the announcement that Sonic the Hedgehog, the company mascot of one of Nintendo's fiercest former rivals, was joining the game's cast only a few months later. When the game did eventually make it to market, fans of these series were delighted to find that Nintendo did right by these foreign franchises, giving the characters varied and well-thought-out movesets that emphasized their personalities. For example, Snake really likes guns, explosives, and weapons, and Sonic has got to go fast. But it doesn't stop there. Nintendo threw in a bunch of tributes and fan service for these games between the stickers, trophies, stages, and music, and even a special treat for Metal Gear Solid fans on the Shadow Moses Island stage. Snake, you know who that is? You're kidding, right? It's Mario. Mario made his first appearance in 1981, and since then, he's become a worldwide phenomenon. There's probably not a single person who doesn't know Mario. He's that famous. Yeah, good thing I survived. 
These days, reveal season for Smash Brothers is one of the most looked forward to events of any given gaming generation. And since Snake and Sonic have joined the fight, fans from all over the gaming universe hang on to each announcement with bated breath, wondering if a character from their favorite non-Nintendo game gets an invitation to Smash. The newest title in the series, Super Smash Bros. Ultimate, has a catchphrase that is, everyone is here, and that's more or less true. With more than a half dozen third-party characters throwing hands with Mario and company, and even more cameos that take the form of assist trophies and spirits, with even more on the way in the form of DLC. Who knew that a proof of concept without official approval from Nintendo would go on to be one of the most ambitious crossovers in all of video game history? And when you get right down to it, the Smash Bros. roster evolving to include third parties is basically analogous of how much better Nintendo has gotten to catering to third parties and indie studios. I don't really have much proof for that claim, but I'll say that we've come a long way from the days of WiiWare. Making my way back to fighting games without platforms, longtime watchers of my channel will remember that I talked about Street Fighter Cross Tekken, a collaboration between the number one 2D and 3D fighting game franchises. For reasons that I laid out in this video, this crossover fighter, which looked and played like a Street Fighter game, didn't quite take off the way that Bandai Namco and Capcom were hoping it would. One victim of the game's failure was a Tekken team developed Tekken style game named, you guessed it, Tekken Cross Street Fighter, which would have brought the World Warriors into the third dimension for the first time since the Street Fighter EX series. The game's development was put on ice around the time of Street Fighter V's release. But don't worry, the Tekken team was continuing work on a major update for the recently released Tekken 7, which will eventually feature one of the most extensive integrations of a crossover character into another game series that I had ever seen. Revealed at the Tekken World Tour Finals in 2015, Street Fighter's Akuma was announced as a new addition to Tekken 7 via the Faded Retribution update. According to an interview with Tekken's Katsuhiro Harada, this crossover was in the works for years and took a lot of coordination with Capcom in order to pull off. As with all of their characters, Akuma was built from the ground up from his model, costumes, and moveset without outside assistance from Capcom. In order to keep as much Street Fighter DNA in Akuma as possible, the Tekken team had to go to the drawing board and figure out how they were going to faithfully remake this character into their game. And here's how they did it. Unlike most of the Tekken 7 cast, Akuma has a two-gauge super meter, of which he can sacrifice half to dash cancel out of an attack, like FADCs in Street Fighter 4. But the similarities don't end there. He has access to all of his special moves, his normal moves look and work the same as if they do in Street Fighter, and the way that Akuma utilizes jumping and pressure makes it seem like you're truly controlling a 2D character in a 3D space. The Tekken team's track record on the crossover characters that they've put into Tekken 7 so far have been hits, one after another, from Geese and Noctis, and eventually... <sighs> Negan. Each character has been faithfully translated into Tekken 7, but what really pushes Akuma's inclusion in over the top for me is that he isn't just any regular guest character, because Harada-san wants every character in his game to have a real reason to fight, Akuma's actually given a pretty significant purpose in the story mode of Tekken 7. Here's a quick spoiler warning, so go to this time in the video if you want to steer clear of spoilers for Tekken 7's story mode. So, Akuma's purpose in the Tekken universe is to fulfill a task given to him by Kazumi Mishima after she saved his life, probably before the events of Tekken 1. That task? To kill Heihachi and Kazuya Mishima. The only reason why he hasn't shown up before the seventh game is because he was, quote, waiting for them to get stronger. And that's significant to me because I think Akuma wouldn't have had any issues taking down the Mishimas if they were at a weaker power level or didn't know how to properly utilize the Devil Gene. So in a weird way, by waiting to confront the Mishimas until now, Akuma is kind of the entire reason why Tekken exists in its current form at all, which is wild considering that Akuma is a guest character from a rival fighting game. And with the way that the story in Tekken 7 ends, I find it hard to believe that they won't mention him if they continue with the Mishima storyline in Tekken 8. All in all, Akuma in Tekken 7 is a really cool take on an already cool character, and I'm happy to highlight him as an example of a really well done crossover character. And as for Tekken Cross Street Fighter, Harada has been keeping the hope alive for people looking forward to that game's completion, recently saying in a recent interview that the game is quote 30% done and that they could potentially find the time to make the game if Tekken 7 moved units, which it totally, totally did.
Celebrity appearances in fighting games are pretty notable because they have the traits of being number one, incredibly rare, and number two, almost always incredibly lame. Sure, you may get excited for Snake in Smash Brothers or Akuma in Tekken 7, but nobody ever talks about Fred Durst in the Fight Club game, Bruce Lee in the UFC games, or even the celebrity deathmatch fighting game where the cast is made up of nothing but celebrities. The use of famous people in the fighting game genre has almost always ended in disappointment. Except for the Def Jam series, but that's probably another topic for another video. Most celebs really don't understand or have that much time or respect for the medium of video games, leading to less than inspired appearances. But one game that you've probably forgotten about actually has one of the strongest, most interesting celebrity casts that I've ever seen in a fighting game. Ready to Rumble Boxing isn't your ordinary boxing game. Released in 1999, this title featured an eclectic mix of out-of-this-world boxers from the groovy Afro Thunder to the intentionally obnoxious J.R. Flurry. The game reviewed well enough and garnered enough support for a sequel just one year after this one launched, but one famous fan was so enraptured by the game that they wanted to play a special role in the development of the next one. That fan? None other than the king of pop, Michael Jackson. To those in the know, this shouldn't be a surprise. Michael Jackson was actually a big time gamer. He collected games and consoles, set up his own arcade at Neverland Ranch, had his own game on the Sega Genesis, helped compose the music for Sonic 3, and personally requested to be put in the 1999 rhythm game Space Channel 5. As the story goes as told by Emmanuel Valdez, the lead artist for Ready to Rumble Boxing Round 2, Jackson was put into the game as a playable fighter after weeks of discussion with the dev team at Midway. He did the mocap for his taunts, his own voice work, and even got dressed in his iconic stage wear to help the team with his texture modeling. The result was a really neat implementation of one of the most iconic and most popular famous people of all time. When the gloved one goes into his super-powered rumble mode, his feet start lighting up the floor, he attacks using all of his iconic dance moves, and apparently, he really enjoyed how his participation in the game turned out. But the celebrity roster doesn't stop there. Shaquille O'Neal, coming off of his 2000 NBA MVP winning season, lent his voice and appearance for the same game. Shaq didn't go quite as far as Michael Jackson did in helping Midway, but he still played like what you'd expect Shaq to play like in a boxing game. A big ol' slow powerhouse who likes to make references to basketball. President Bill Clinton and First Lady Hillary Clinton were absolutely not featured in Ready to Rumble Boxing Round 2. Instead, two characters with very similar traits, ages, heights, and appearances named Mr. President and the First Lady were. And even the lovable ring announcer Bruce Buffer gets in on the action as the final boss of the game as the ever-imposing Rumble Man. Ready to Rumble Boxing Round 2 was my personal first exposure to crossovers in video games, and while they may not have made the game any more fun to play, I actually went back and played it for this video, and man, that game did not age well. Back then, these guest characters gave me some of my fondest memories as a wee lad. Sticking with boxing for just a little bit longer, did you know that if you enter the code MACMAN in the character creator of Fight Night Round 2 for the GameCube, you will unlock Little Mac from Super Punch-Out as a playable fu- OH MY GOD! Here's Johnny! Jesus Christ, that's terrifying! Why does Little Mac look like he was stung by like a thousand bees? Look at those eyes! Ugh! Jeez. Give me the heebie-jeebies, let's move on. Ugh. Lastly, I wanted to talk about the series that helped me get this channel its start. Marvel vs. Capcom. But during the writing process of this script, I wondered exactly what I would write about. Of course, the MVC series carries a special place in the fighting game community's part, and it's one of the most famous crossover titles to ever exist, but both companies share top billing, and none of these games treat any character like a special guest. I could talk about the history of the series or the games leading up to it like X-Men Children of the Atom, which did feature an Akuma crossover, but I feel like that would be best suited for another video. A topic like that seems a bit too broad, and I do eventually want to make that video, but I'd rather give it the attention it deserves. But then, it hit me. 
There are four characters in the entirety of the Marvel vs. Capcom series who made their first appearances in these games, never to be seen again outside of some very minor cameos. And because of that, they somehow managed to be special guests in a series that is basically made up of special guests. For the sake of clarity, I'm not going to include Sun Sun in this list while her MVC2 incarnation is technically the granddaughter of Sun Sun from the NES version of that game. I feel like there's enough similarity there to say that they're functionally the same character. So starting with the weirdest character exclusive, Norimaro is a parody of Japanese comedian Noritake Kinashi. I'm not all that well versed in the Japanese comedy scene, but this guy must have been a pretty big deal because Capcom partnered with him and his television show to make his own personal fighting game character. Originally, they were supposed to slot this creation in an upcoming Street Fighter game, but instead they fit Norimaro in the next game Capcom was set to release, which ended up being Marvel Super Heroes vs. Street Fighter. The best way that I can describe his playstyle is if you mashed up Phoenix Wright from Marvel 3 and Peacock from Skullgirls. Dude has some strong keep away tools and throws everything, including the kitchen sink, literally, to keep you out of his personal space. If this is the first time you're seeing this guy, there's probably a good reason for that. Norimaro was only available for play in the Japanese version of the game, which makes sense for obvious reasons. There's evidence to suggest that this character was actually in late stages of being localized for Western audiences with translated win quotes and some alterations to his super combo animations. However, I get the feeling like throwing in a character who's a take on an obscure Japanese comedian wasn't all that appealing to Western audiences and thus, Norimaru was removed from English versions of the game. Moving on, the next one-shot character in the series isn't actually playable at all. It's the final boss of Marvel vs. Capcom 2, and the only completely original boss character in the entire vs. series, Abyss. I'm actually a big fan of Abyss's design. Despite being an entirely original character for MVC2, every phase of the Abyss fight looks like something you could feasibly see in a Marvel comic book. His backstory is also very Marvel-esque, essentially being the embodiment of the concept of entropy, spurring characters from the Marvel and Capcom universes to action. Phase 1 of this fight is a big hulking armored body, and Phase 2 is this weird slimy thing, and eventually Phase 3 is this big honking beast. To me, Abyss is actually up there with some of the most fun boss fights that I've played in a fighting game. Abyss actually can't be put into hit stun. So he stands there as you dish out a beating, and I played a whole bunch of Cable in Marvel vs. Capcom too, so being able to just stand there and throw out a Hyper Viper Beam with the knowledge that it'll hit and melt the heck out of Abyss's health bar is the equivalent of getting a nice new piece of technology and peeling the plastic off, it's so just, ooh, it's so satisfying. Mm. Next up is a character that is a bit of an enigma. Amingo is a sharp dressing cactus and has a name that sounds like Amigo. He can shapeshift, had his hometown wrecked by Abyss, looks like a distant family member of Ludicolo, and he kinda sucked in MVC too, despite having the potential for some incredibly succulent pressure. But getting to the point, this is basically all we know about him. There's a rumor that I found that mentions that Amingo was supposed to feature in his own game that was eventually cancelled but there's no sources, leads, or otherwise any information on what that game could have been, and no confirmation from officials one way or the other. You could say that Capcom is really sticking to their guns on that one. There's talk of Amingo potentially being a rejected Darkstalkers character, which I actually think is a totally credible guess, considering that his attacks feature him expanding, contracting, and morphing, which are all very Darkstalkers traits. But considering the state of the Darkstalkers franchise, that's probably a bit of a prickly situation to bring up, because Capcom hasn't even come out and said anything confirming or denying even that tiny fan theory. Amingo is so obscure that even in his official bio, in the Marvel vs. Capcom Complete Works art book, he's listed as being of a mysterious origin. Nobody knows if Amingo will ever show up in another game, but at least this'll be the day that he gets his shine. Lastly, did you know that Marvel vs. Capcom 2 had lore? <laughs> yeah, I didn't either. Whereas Ryu is the main character of the Street Fighter series and as Scorpion is from Mortal Kombat, the last character I'll talk about in this video, the magic-wielding Baroness of the Seven Seas, Ruby Hart, is apparently the main character of MVC2. 
we can draw this conclusion from a few different points of reference. She and Cable both get the center spot in the character select screen for Capcom and Marvel respectively. You can see what is possibly Ruby's ship getting built in one stage and fighting on that same ship in another. She appears smack dab in the middle of this marketing poster alongside Cable. And when you beat the final boss, your reward is a series of images of the Marvel and Capcom heroes taking pictures, celebrating, and having a good time on Ruby's ship. But Ruby Hart, no, not her. She's holding what is left of Abyss, an all-powerful being in her hand, before she's like, nah, I'm sure I'll have chances to shine in other games before chucking that thing off the ship and riding off into the sunset. It's pretty heavily implied that she's actually the one shuttling all of these fighters around the world to stop Abyss and his ambiguously ambiguous plot. As it turns out, unlike a Mingo, Ruby Hart is allegedly confirmed by former Capcom employee Seth Killian to have been a Darkstalkers character that was left on the cutting room floor. I'd love to show you the video, but Ustream ain't quite what it once was. Unfortunately, Father Time hasn't been too good to the seafaring Frenchwoman. She was pinned in as one of the main characters for what was supposed to be a pirate-themed social game in Japan named Gai Kokai Frontier. However, that game was cancelled after being stuck in development hell for at least three years. These days, Ruby Hart is still looking for her next big break, and she could get it in the Street Fighter series. Ruby was given a fighter profile on the Shadow Luke Combat Research Institute. And while this isn't exactly THE Ruby Heart, the artist says that it's actually a relative, so it's good to know that Ruby Heart's character design hasn't completely fallen off of Gatcom's radar. So that does it for this edition of my guest character series. There's a ton of amazing crossovers that I didn't come anywhere close to touching, like the trio of guest characters from Soul Calibur 2 and a whole bunch of others, so expect a part 2 to this video sometime in the future. In the meantime, if there are any great guest characters you'd like to see me cover in this style in that next video, let me know in the comments below. Subscribe to me on YouTube, follow me on Twitter and Twitch, and have some fun in the comments. I'll see you again next time.